Hi, Lisha. Hi, Savio. We are just waiting to know the time. When it's uh, 16, we will start, 4 p.m. Hi, Fabio. So hello and welcome to our first webinar of the series SBBC ISCSCR. Before we start, I'd like to thank the people that made these webinars possible. Lígia Pereira from the Institute of Biology at University of Sao Paulo. Lígia is a member of the ISCSCR Board of Directors and she introduced our idea to the ISCSCR Board. Nancy Witte and Jack Moshe from ISSCR that embraced the idea and were of great support. The four speakers that accepted our invitation. We also want to thank the SBBC Board of Directors, especially Patricia Gama, our former president, and Irene Yan, for all the help in putting these webinars and broadcasts together. And also Keith Alm, uh, who will you now say a few words about the SESCR. Unfortunately, uh, Jack Mosher and Keith were not able to be here with us today, uh, but they recorded, so Keith uh, recorded a video and we are gonna watch it now.
And so we are going to go on with um, Dr. Janet uh, Rosen's uh, talk. We are really, really sorry, but we are going to add uh, Keith's uh, video afterwards. We are so sorry. We apologize for that. So uh, now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Janet Roussan, uh, who I thank very much for being here with us today. It's an honor to have you. Uh, Dr. Janet Roussan is a senior scientist in the developmental and stem cell biology program at the Hospital for Sick Children. She is a professor in the Department of Molecular Genetics in Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Toronto, Canada. Uh, she trained at the universities of Oxford and Cambridge in the United Kingdom. And uh, Dr. Rosen has been recognized for her contributions to science with many awards. She is a fellow of both the Roy Royal Societies of London and Canada, and is a foreign associate of the US National Academy of Science. Uh, Dr. Rosen was the first woman to receive the Canada Gardner uh, Whitman Award and she is the president and scientific director of the Gardner Foundation since 2016. She's actively involved in the international developmental and stem cell biology communities and has contributed to the scientific and ethical discussion on public issues related to stem cell research. She has an impressive list of publications and her lab is focused on the mechanisms of self-aid decisions in the early mouse embryo and their application to the maintenance and differentiation of embryo-derived stem cells. Her research in the early embryo has led to the discovery of a new placenta stem cell type, the trophoblast stem cell. So Dr. Rosan, thank you very much again and it's a pleasure and honor to have you with us. Thank you very much indeed. It's a it is a pleasure to be here and to be representing the ISSCR and our partnership with the Brazilian Cell Biology Society. Um, I could tell you more about ISSCR if you like, but we can discuss that at, at the end. Uh, it's a great opportunity. ISSCR is, of course, an international stem cell society, and it's very important for us to have partnerships with international societies around the world. So I'm not going to spend more time on that, um, but I will now share my screen and talk to you about what I'm interested in, which is, as you said, the early embryo and its derived stem cells. And then we'll touch on the end about how that's relevant to human development and stem cells. So I'm going to share my screens. Give me a moment here. And is that sharing for you? Yes, it looks fine. I'm waiting for the lag in the YouTube. Okay. All right. So um, the title of my talk today is Making the Blastocyst. The Blastocyst is my favorite stage of embryonic development. And I've worked on it for a very long time, off and on. I've worked on other things along the way. But I keep coming back to this fascinating stage, the earliest stage of development. And it leads us from cells to genes to stem cells. The goal of my talk today, I have really three goals that I'd like you to take away from this. I want you to have some understanding of the process of early development, the transition from totipotency to what we all know a lot more about or hear about, pluripotency. I want to relate this to the properties of stem cells that are derived from the blastocyst. And I'm going to compare and contrast mouse and human embryo and stem cell development. Well, obviously, the majority of my talk is going to be about the mouse, not just because that's what I work on, but because we know more, a lot more about the mouse still at this point in development. So here we are, the very early processes of mouse development from the zygote to the blastocyst stage. And it takes about four days to go from the single cell to the blastocyst. And during that period, three cell types are set aside. The trophectoderm, which is the outer layer of the blastocyst, and the two groups of cells inside the, bla the blastocyst, the primitive endoderm and the, and the uh, epiblast. And I'll come back to what they give rise to later on. But if you just look at this diagrammatic picture of what goes on during these early stages, you'll see that it looks as though there's a progressive specialization 
cells become different from each other and eventually end up with a segregated system where there are three cell types of the blastocyst. And what we know, and I'm not going to describe over many years and lots of different experiments, we know that in fact this process from zygote to blastocyst is a gradual process. It's not that suddenly all three lineages are set aside, it's a gradual progression uh, of cell lineages being set aside. And in fact, the trophectoderm, which is the outer layer of the cells of the blastocyst, is actually restricted to its cell lineage before the enclosed cells, which contain the pluripotent cells. But by the time you get to the expanded 100 cell blastocyst, all the experimental data says that these lineages are now set in stone. You have three lineages and they know what they're going to give rise to and you can't change their mind. And what do they give rise to? Here is a real blastocyst. It's one of the fake picture I've used in many, many talks, but it's still my favorite picture. Here is a mouse blastocyst just about to implant in the uterus. Uh, and what we see is that the outer cells, the trophectoderm, give rise to the trophoblast layers of the placenta. The primitive endoderm on the surface there give rise to endoderm layers of the yolk sac, both of which are extra embryonic cell types. They're what the embryo needs to survive in the uterus, and they're also important sources of signals to pattern the fetus itself. And it's that little group of pink cells stained there uh, with an antibody to OCT4, the most famous pluripotency marker. It's those pink cells, the epiblast, that are indeed the pluripotent cells of the blastocyst and give rise to all the cell types of the fetus, including the germ cells and indeed a number of other extra embryonic cell types as well. So epiblast cells are pluripotent. The other cells are restricted to, uh, to um, extra embryonic lineages. So if we watch this process, we'll see in real time that the segregation here of the trophectoderm and the inner cell mass is a gradual process, just as I showed you in the sort of image uh, in the uh, diagram, but it's a complex process. Cells start to turn on CDX2, which is a key marker and gene involved in trophectoderm formation. And then as CDX2 becomes very high in the outside cells, the inside cells turn down CDX2 and start to turn on genes like SOX2, uh, NANOG, and indeed OP4. So this is a gradual progression. Uh, we can see this now because using CRISPR, we've been able to generate lots and lots of different mice lines very rapidly now that have different fluorescent tags on all these important developmental genes. And combined with uh, live imaging and the tools of microscopy, we're getting a much better dynamic view of early development as we go forward. But if we think about just you see that gradual segregation, if we think about then just the first lineage decision between the inner cell mass, the pluripotent cells, and the trophectoderm, what we know from a lot of studies from many labs over many years, and these are just a few listed on the right, that this dynamic process that I showed you in the imaging is related to morphogenetic changes that occur as the cells divide from the eight cell to the 16 cell from the 16 to the 32, and 32 to uh, 64 cell. And in particular, we see that there's a gradual segregation of polarized cells on the outside of the embryo, which go on to form the trophectoderm of the uh, blastocyst itself. And as they become polarized and cells become separated to inside and outside compartments, we start to see these dynamic changes in, gene, in transcription factor gene expression that I showed you just now. So morpho morphological changes are accompanied by this gradual restriction of cell fate and gene expression. So that's all very well, but how does that happen? What is it that sets aside the two cell types and really says you know, CDX2 and the lineage markers of trophectoderm are going to be expressed in the outside cells and SOX2, NANOG, and OP4 are going to be in the side cells. So, the question we had several years ago was, well, given this morphological changes that are occurring, we see that there are changes in cell adhesion, cell polarity, cells take up different positions. Is there a signaling pathway that coordinates all of those things and could help stabilize cell fate? And the answer we know now is the HIPPO signaling pathway. 
But the first clue to that came from Ray Amy Ralston when she was a postdoc in my lab, and also here at Suzaki's lab in Japan, looking at this co-activator gene called YAP. It's a co-activator of T transcription factors. And for reasons that I won't go into, we started to look to see where it was expressed and particularly where it was localized during development. And what you see on the top line there is that YAP is expressed in all the cells of the pre-implantation stages. But as the cells go through to the blastocyst, we start to see that it becomes strongly nuclear localized in the outside cells and excluded from the nuclei in the inside cells that are going to go on to form the inner cell mass. So this was a remarkable nuclear localization. This wasn't transcriptional, this was a post-transcriptional event, suggesting then that YAP localization and its uh, associated transcription factors could be key to setting up the trophectoderm and then secondarily uh, uh, essentially blocking the inner cell mass formation. And if you overlay YAP localization with CDX2 localization, you'll see that they combine almost completely. So a whole lot of experiments have gone on to suggest that indeed this is part of the HIPPO signaling pathway. So YAP was first identified as a partner of the, HIPPO, of the transcription factor scalloped in Drosophila, teed in mammals. And we know that that is regulated by this very important serine uh, kinase, LATS, that phosphorylates YAP and keeps it out of the nucleus. And for LATS to be active, it has to be in this very large complex that's at the cell membrane. Merlin, NF2, angiomotin, are particularly important components of this complex, and they are absolutely required for, for LATS to be active and YAP to be phosphorylated. So what happens when you mutate components of the HIPPO signaling pathway? And there have been many studies from my lab, from HERO's lab, and other labs mutating different components of the HIPPO signaling pathway and showing very clearly that indeed this is the main driver of linear specification between inner cell mass and trophectoderm. And here's one example from my lab. Katie Coburn, when she was in the lab, did an experiment where she knocked out NF2, which is the Merlin equivalent in mouse. It's inherited maternally, so you have to make a maternal zygotic knockout, so this has, doesn't have any NF2 coming in from mum or any zygotic expression. And what you see is whereas a normal embryo has YAP in the outside, Actually, the mutants have YAP in all the cells of the blastocyst. It makes a blastocyst, so the morphogenetic changes occur, but cell fate is not established. And essentially, all the cells think they're trophectoderm. They have YAP, nuclear YAP, and they have CDX2 in the cells. They die shortly after implantation because they're all just like a ball of trophectoderm. So this and other studies now give us a model that is more or less as shown here. There are still components that we don't fully understand, but we have a pretty good idea that indeed uh, in the inside cells of the blastocyst, the LATS is active, the complex is active, YAP is phosphorylated, can't enter the nucleus, you can't get CDX2 expression. In the outside cells, because they have this polarity, there's an apical actin domain that binds some of the components of the, of the uh, hippo complex. The complex does not form together. You can't get activated LATS and YAP enters the nucleus and activates the trophectoderm pathway. So this is, I think, a very nice example of post-translational modifications that are setting up cell fate. One of the things that has been of interest in understanding mouse development is how similar it is to human. And there's a lot of data suggesting that mouse and human, although many of the transcription factors are conserved, the actual signaling pathways and so on may not be the same. We'll talk a bit perhaps about that later. But just recently, Kathy Nyakin's lab has published a paper in Nature in which they carried out some of very similar uh, modifications and alterations that we had done in, in the mouse system to, jet, to show that in fact, in the human embryo as well, it appears that there's a pretty conserved role for this hippo yap signaling in setting up the outside cells, the trophectoderm from the inner cell mass. So this is a case where there is clear conservation. They also looked at cows, so cows have the same pathway as well. So what we know then from the formation of the blastocyst and the separation of the trophectoderm and the inner cell mass is it is a gradual process. We can see that happening. It's, that makes sense in terms of the establishment of these inside and outside domains. 
I haven't showed you, but there's a whole load of single cell RNA-seq data from my lab and others that, again, shows this gradual segregation of lineages. And the trophectinum is definitely restricted before the pluripotent inner cell mass. And that's because you really get this gap uh, activation in the outside cells. And then secondarily, the inside cells take up the inner cell mass uh, pathway. And that this plasticity really is aligned with when the cells are responding to the app signal. But that's only one lineage decision that blastocyst made. Right at the beginning, I showed you there are three cell types in the blastocyst. First, you make trophectoderm, then you've got the enclosed cells, but then they have to go on and segregate further to make the primitive endoderm and the epiblast. So the primitive endoderm on the, on the surface of the inner cell mass and the epiblast enclosed. Quite a long time ago now, uh, we looked at the earlier blastocyst and using antibodies to our favorite transcription factors, we looked at where they are expressed. And what you see is that CDX2 is outside, that's what we would expect. But the inner cell mass actually is a bit of a mess. It's a mosaic of expression, co-expression of GATA6, which is a primitive endoderm marker, NANOG, which is an uh, epiblast marker, and some cells that seem to express both. And so this does resolve. So somehow this, this process resolves over time. And this doesn't look like an inside-outside story, although the cells end up in a sort of positional dependent association in the inner cell mass itself. That's not what's happening in this case. Somehow this mosaic system is sorting itself out. So what is happening there? Well, again, we can tag genes. Here we have GATA6, which is in the trophectoderm as well as the primitive endoderm. And nano, you see nano coming up, but it's coming up shared with GATA6 in many cells. This is a very complicated dance that's going on here. Cells are turning on nano, turning it off again. GATA6 is being segregated. And then eventually you end up with the enclosed cells having the, uh, the nano and the GATA6 on the surface. But it's by no means a simple dance. And there's a lot more to be learned about how that dance occurs. What we do know, however, is that the dance is regulated by FGF signaling. And this comes about because we and others over the years have done a series of experiments where we've uh, um, regulated and altered the levels of FGF signaling in the early embryo. And I won't go into why we thought this was important, but there was a lot of hypothesis to support this idea that in fact, blocking FGF signaling is going to be important to make the, the epiblast cells and promoting FGF signaling is important for making primitive endoderm. And in fact, if you take an early blastocyst and using inhibitors to FGF receptors and to ERK uh, signaling, you can turn all the inner cell mass cells into epiblasts. There's no primitive endoderm. If you do the reverse and stimulate the pathway with excess FGF4, then what you see is now all the inner cell mass cells become primitive endoderm. It's not that you're losing the other cell types, you're really getting transformation of one cell type to another. So it looks as though in the inner cell mass itself, cells are reading out local levels of FGF and making a decision to become primitive endoderm. And then there is a segregation process, we believe related to the fact that the, the FGF signaling starts pathways that alter the cell adhesion properties of the two cell types so that they segregate out. So without going, this is a quick pass over a lot of work from many labs over many years, but just to say that by the time you get to the blastocyst, it's kind of interesting that we've got two different kinds of signaling events that lead to linear segregation. The inner cell mass trovectoderm segregation requires position-dependent activation of HIPPO signaling for establishing cell fate. And it actually also uses FGF, which comes from those epiblast cells. The FGF is required for proliferation of the trophoblast that goes on to allow the embryo to implant in the uterus. So the FGF is involved in the trophoblast, but it's not involved in activating the pathway. And the epiblast primitive endoderm segregation then requires, we have this sort of stochastic, we still don't understand exactly how individual cells set up different levels of FGF signaling. But the bottom line out of that is that you end up with two populations, which then sort out to form epiblast and primitive endoderm. So given all that, we've got a blastocyst now, 
A mouse blastocyst, it has three cell types, trophectoderm, epiblast, and primitive endoderm. The epiblast and primitive endoderm are mixed up to start with, but segregate out by four and a half days. And we know that, in fact, we can make stem cells from the blastocyst, from the mouse blastocyst, from all three cell types. And they relate to the lineages they came from. So stem cells, to be useful, we would like them to really mimic the cell types of the embryo. And of course, we know the most famous stem cells from the blastocyst are the embryonic stem cells, which arise from and are equivalent to, in many, case, in many ways, in gene expression and properties, with the epiblast uh, progenitors uh, in the uh, blastocyst. So they express OCT4 and ANOG. When you put them back into a chimera, they contribute to the same lineages that the epiblasts of the blastocyst would give rise to and not to the placenta or the yolk sac. And in fact, embryonic stem cells we showed years ago with Andras Naji can actually make an entire fetus if you provide them with the trophectoderm and the primitive endoderm support. So ES cells look like epiblast. And over the years, my lab has been able to derive trophoblast stem cells and Zen cells, which have different morphologies, can proliferate in, uh, in culture, and have their own lineage-specific transcription factors, which are equivalent to the ones used in the embryo. And when you put these cells back in chimeras, they remember where they came from. They re retain their lineage specificity and give rise to the placenta from trophoblast stem cells and to the yolk sac endoderm from Zen cells. So we have three distinct cell, stem cell types representing all three cell types in the embryo itself. So this is a nice system then to try to use these stem cells that we know so much, uh, we can grow so many more of to understand more about what it is about linear specification and the maintenance of stem cell states. And one of the things that became obvious pretty early on, I think is very interesting to think about and think about when you're trying to derive stem cells from other embryos or other stem, uh, tissues, that the stem cell states that we derive from the mouse blastocyst actually make sense with what we know, and what I just told you about the in vivo linear state in the blastocyst itself. So all these stem cell types, the ES cells, T S cells, and Zen, they derive from mouse blastocysts in culture. And ES cells, when they were first derived, were grown in lymph and serum. And in that condition, they're kind of a bit of mosaic. They look like the inner cell mass. They have pluripotent cells, but they're always budding off differentiated primitive endoderm and other cell types. So it's a mosaic situation, very much like the situation in the embryo itself. Austin Smith's lab a few years ago now showed that you could get what are called naive stem cells, which are much more uniform and homogeneously related to the epiblast, and they, you have to inhibit FGF. And I just showed you that if you inhibit FGF in the embryo itself, what do you get? You turn all the inner cell mass into epiblasts. So this FGF inhibition is consistent with how the, what the embryo is doing around inhibiting FGF to get maintenance of the pluripotent cell type. TS cells are actually grown in the presence of FGF4. And I told you, though I didn't show you data, that the FGF from the inner cell mass is required for proliferation of the trophoblast in vivo and actually for post-implantation trophoblasts as well. And so it makes sense that FGF4 is required for trophoblast stem cell maintenance. And then Zen cells, you require FGF to get them started, other components as well, but FGF is required to get cells, Zen cells started from the inner cell mass. And that again makes sense because when you add FGF, you're promoting primitive endoderm and blocking epiblast formation. So it's important they reflect the in vivo lineage state. So I wanted to give you perhaps a little bit of a preview of something you're going to hear about uh, later on from Nicola Rivron. Um, often when I, many, over many years, when I've presented talks and show that we can generate stem cells from the blastocyst and we have all these, you know, that, that are equivalent to the different cell types of the blastocyst, I would often be asked, well, what happens if you put them all together? Can you regenerate an embryo, a blastocyst? Can you actually take all these different blastocyst stem cells and combine them together to make a mouse? I told you that ES cells, when combined with normal embryo, extra embryonic lineages, trophoblast and primitive endoderm, can indeed make a mouse. But can we replace the, embryo, the, the in vivo embryonic cells totally 
with stem cells. Well, so there's been a lot of recent studies trying to do exactly this. And I'll just show you a couple of, of pretty pictures and examples. So Magdalena Zernich at Goetz's lab uh, took our three cells, the ES cells, the TS cells, and the Zen cells, and grew them in a 3D matrix and allowed, mixed them all up and allowed them to sort out. And in the best case scenario, I'm sure not every embryo, not every embryo it looked like this, but they were able to generate structures that don't look like a blastocyst, but they do look like the very early post-implantation mouse embryo. And one of these is a real embryo, and one of these is what they call ETX, uh, a stem cell derived embryo model. I think this is the uh, stem cell model, and this is a real embryo because it's got loose cells at the top here. Could be the other way around. Uh, but this is, these are uh, ES cells, these are TS cells, and then on the outside, the Zen cells sort themselves out. So this is promising and certainly an interesting system to think about how lineages might interact and talk to each other because you can generate a lot of these uh, stem cell models. Nicola Rivron, and you're going to hear more about this later, did what uh, I kind of like best, I guess, because he actually tried to regenerate a blastocyst. And he did that by taking ES cells, making little clumps of them, and putting them in little micro well arrays, as shown here, and then sort of sprinkling TS cells on top. And in that situation, you could get the situation where again, you generate what really does look quite like a, blast, a blastocyst. So these are blastocysts and these are blastoids. In both of these cases, whether it's the ETX or the blastoids, they really don't develop much further. So they're not perfect at this point. Uh, if you, they're both groups implanted them back in the uterus and they do cause a sort of implantation response but the embryo itself or the embryoid or model, uh, the aggregate does not carry on any further. So this is not a perfect model of early development. There are a variety of reasons why that might be. Uh, and one of them might be that if we're trying, particularly if we're trying to get a blastocyst, first of all, they don't have primitive endoderm in that original blastoid, so you're missing a cell type. Uh, but also, if you want to get a blastocyst, you really are going to have to perhaps replicate those early phases I just talked about, the generation of the cells leading up to the blastocyst. And so the stem cell types that we've established from the expanded blastocyst might not be quite right to generate a blastocyst itself. So there's more to be done even in the mouse. Now, question becomes, uh, okay, this is the mouse. Can we think about modeling embryo development with human stem cells? And this, I think, is extremely important. This is where stem cell-derived embryo models would really come into their own because, of course, we have limited access to human embryos. And although people have been doing more culturing of human embryos and looking at the early post-implantation stages, it's still a limited uh, time because of the 14-day rule that applies in most jurisdictions worldwide, but also just in terms of being able to organize the embryo in culture in this kind of way. So there's a lot of interest in seeing whether the embryo, the stem cell derived embryo models could be taken over into the human system. And that leads us back to some of the differences between the mouse and the human. So are there stem cells equivalent to the ones I talked to you about in the mouse? Can we get stem cells from the three cell types of the human blastocyst? And the answer is we don't really quite know yet. It's just beginning. Obviously, ES cells have been derived for a long time. But until recently, human ES cells were thought to be much more equivalent to the sort of later epiblast-like cells in the mouse. They're further down the pathway. Uh, and in fact, human ES cells grow in the presence of FGF, whereas I told you that the way to get mouse ES cells is to inhibit FGF signaling. More recently, a number of groups have used different culture conditions uh, to generate what, a, what they think are equivalent to the mouse naive cells closer to the epiblast or the blastocyst, and they're not dependent anymore on FGF. So they are perhaps closer to the mouse blast, epiblast. But still, if you look at the comparative gene expression arrays and so on, it's not entirely clear how they line up with the mouse system. Human TS cells 
we tried many years and many times to generate human TS cells from human blastocysts using the same conditions, promoting FGF uh, signaling that we used in the mouse and were unsuccessful. We showed that human trifectoderm actually is not responsive to FGF. So this is another case where there's a real difference. The early human trifectoderm in plants without proliferation, it invades without proliferation. And so we couldn't get TS cells that way. Most recently, Okai et al. and a couple of other groups have been able to derive what seem to be looking like human trophoblast stem cells. They can derive them from a blastocyst or early uh, chorionic villus, villus uh, outgrowth. They are not dependent on FGF, which is what we would predict. They're dependent on a number of other signals. And so they exist. The question will become, will, are they equivalent enough to the trophectin and the blastocyst to be able to make embryo models? Human Zen-like cells should be available, but they haven't been very much. There's a recent paper from Josh, Mich Josh Brickman's lab suggesting that they have some human Zen-like cells. So we are going to see in the next little while, for sure, we're going to see uh, the development of these kind of stem cell models. Um, there's some intriguing differences I've already said but with regard to trophoblast stem cells. And even the naive ES cells, there's an intriguing difference that I think takes us back to thinking about embryo differences. So mouse and human stem cells, are they the same? So these naive human ES cells that have been generated, it looks as though increasing bits and pieces of evidence suggest that unlike what I told you in the mouse, where an ES cell is restricted to the epiblast lineage, just like the epiblast in the blastocyst, naive ES cells in the human have some in, uh, properties that suggest they might not be so lineage committed. Their expression profile shows similarity, not just to the epiblast, but also to earlier stages. They have transposon expression and other properties similar to cleavage stages, so they're kind of in a mixed state. And a couple of recent papers have suggested that they may be able to generate trophoblast stem cells directly, whereas mouse ES cells cannot do that. So that's interesting. It suggests but maybe we should think again about the similarities and differences between the mouse blastocyst and the human blastocyst. Because I told you that when you make stem cells and you get these different properties, you better be thinking about what the embryo is doing. So if human ES cells have this broader capacity to make trophoblasts, then does this suggest that the blastocyst in the human has more plasticity? There's a recent uh, bioarchive reprint that you can see from Austin Smith's lab that suggests exactly that, that if you can take early inner cell mass cells from the blastocyst and they appear to be able to generate trophectoderm and trophoblast stem cells. And as I say, some of these other papers have suggested that the stem cells themselves can generate TS cells. There was one, there's one published paper in the literature showing indeed that human early blastocyst cells do seem to be uncommitted to lineage focusing particularly on the outside cells, taking the trophectoderm cells, the outside cells, labeling them, re putting them together, and reconstituting a perfectly good blastocyst. I told you that in the mouse, by the time you get a blastocyst, the trophectoderm cannot do that. It can do it earlier, but it cannot do it. In the same paper, they also showed that the inside cells, fewer numbers, the inside cells could also regenerate the blastocyst. So we've got plasticity in the human embryo, We've got clearly different, must be different signaling pathways involved in, in this process of lineage commitment. And I think we need to understand more about the embryo to really understand how to, what we know about human stem cells and to understand stem cell, we need to understand stem cells before we can model human development with stem cell derived embryo models. So we need comparison to the human, uh, we need to think about non-human primate models as a way of getting more information. But I think this concept that you can go back and forth between embryo and stem cells needs to be borne in mind when people generate stem cells. They need to be thinking about what the embryo itself is doing. But, you know, the mouse embryo is still there. We still don't fully understand it. And that we can, under we can use the embryo not just to understand the specificities of mouse development, but the kind of processes that lead to lineage specification, whether they're the same pathways or not, the underlying principles that we find in the mouse 
are going to be relevant to many other systems. So I will stop there. Uh, I, this is, I've sort of given you a kind of overview of research over, over many years, and there's many people who have contributed to that. Some of the more recent work that we've been doing uh, with stem cells and with uh, imaging stem cells is very uh, um, uh, dependent on Esther Postfi and Bin Gu, who developed the 2C CRISPR approach that we use to rapidly generate genetically modified mice. Uh, Brian Bradshaw and Alex have been using that for, for lineage tracing. We have great collaborators at Genelia, and a lot of the work that I didn't really describe on single cell RNA seq, et cetera, is so a good collaboration with Frederick Lana's lab, the Karolinska. And this is the Sick Kids. Uh, research building, and this is a cold day in Toronto at City Hall where we are skating on the ice. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much for this beautiful talk and beautiful images and videos. We have uh, some questions that were posted while we were speaking. So uh, we're going to start with one uh, by Irene, yeah. Uh, she's asking, uh, is the heterochrony in blastocyst lineage commitment an evolutionary feature? Is it an evolutionary feature? Yeah. You mean whether it has a, whether there's some reason to the, <laughs> to the, the, time, the difference in timing? Um, has it a positive or negative advantage? I don't know. Does it relate to other differences? The answer is almost certainly yes. So between the mouse and the human, for example, we know that the, the whole timing of events in the early embryo is, is different. And I think particularly important is the fact that zygotic genome activation, when the genome, zygotic genome turns on, is later in the, in the human than the mouse. But the morphological processes of going forward to generate the blastocyst are still moving forward in both the mouse and the human. But if you haven't activated your zygotic genome, you may be able to undergo the beginnings of morphogenesis using maternal uh, proteins and so on, but you can't start lineage formation until you activate the zygotic genome. So I think some of it is related to that delay in the activation of the zygotic uh, genome. Whether that's an advantage or a disadvantage, I, I really wouldn't know. Okay, thank you. So we have uh, one question regarding the extracellular matrix. Uh, so Marcel Lamas asked uh, if it is, is it possible that changes in the stiffness of the surrounding extracellular matrix might contribute to the YAP translocation and then to self fate determination? Yeah, so that's a good, it's a good question. Um, and the answer is that actually during the cleavage stages, there's very little extracellular matrix. When you look at, and I'll come back to that, when you get to epiblast primitive endoderm segregation, clearly now you start to see ECM being laid down, particularly between, between the developing epiblast and the primitive endoderm, laid down mostly by the primitive endoderm. So we do think that that has a role in separating out and segregating the lineages and could obviously part of that, uh, especially if it's FGF, of course, the extracellular matrix is going to potentially uh, be involved in FGF signaling. In the early embryo, however, not extracellular matrix, but mechanical signaling almost certainly is going to be important. And there's a number of studies suggesting that uh, cell, cell tension and uh, uh, contractility are important components of establishing the outer and inner cells, and that almost certainly uh, part of those processes are having an impact on the app uh, localization. So I, I think there's, there's, not, there's not a lot of positive data, obviously there's a lot of positive data in other systems that mechanical signaling can affect uh, YAP localization. Less direct evidence in the mouse, although people are trying to do that. My feeling is that it probably is the first signal, but as you start to see polarity, that is going to change the sort of mechanical tension, and that's going to cause the first shifts in the app but then the hippo signaling and the phosphorylation is going to be important to make sure that it stays that way um, so that that comes in as a sort of secondary level to phosphorylate yap and maintain the differences between the inside and outside cells so this would be one way to direct uh, when you, you try to assemble the uh, the embryo using the the cells would be like if you change the extracellular matrix, maybe you could direct more. 
Yes, yes. So, I mean, people have tried that, um, but it's the early embryo, it's a little hard to, to yeah. do that. Um, obviously, with stem cells, you can start, you can certainly play around with matrices and you certainly have big effects on uh, morphology and differentiation. So, it's pretty clear. And I think there's a lot of nice bioengineering type of work where you can, again, using these sort of stem cell models, you can begin to model. Uh, the formation of the different lineages, and it's clearly dependent on the uh, extracellular matrix and, and the niche. There's no question. But the, the cleavage stages, I don't want to say there's no ECM there, but it's not a major player. You, you might, of course, ask me, maybe you did, <laughs> whether the zona pellucida, which is around the embryo itself, could, I mean, it could have a role. And the answer is that the zona pellucida seems to be more of a shell. You can certainly grow the embryo without the zona pellucida without any effect, but there is evidence that it has some effect on the association of cells, on the topology, so, but it's not really um, providing pressure to the, to the point where it would, I think, regulate YAP, but it, it is a component that we should think about. Thank you. Uh... I think we have a question about uh, FGF gradient. Um, if uh, is there oh, here it is. Is there a gradient of uh, FGF effect in the endoderm at the beginning? Particular. Yeah, no, no. People, and um, so uh, a number of studies in a recent study from Claire Shows lab where they're trying to look more detail at you know where FGF is, where the receptors are, where where particularly the downstream ERK signaling is activated. And it looks as the, it, I'm not gonna say it's random, but it's not, there's no gradient. It really does appear as though it's um, distributed throughout the inner cell mass. And it almost looks as though you would say this is a notch type of lateral inhibition story. Once you have a little bit more FGF being secreted by an epiblast cell, the cell next to it receives the signal and turns down FGF, and you get this sort of feedback loops that essentially segregate out the lineages. But I would say we don't fully understand that at this point. There's a, just one more question about uh, FGF uh, by Greg Keaton. If there's a different isoform or different isoforms of FGF expressed in the early uh, mouse versus uh, human. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm, 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 I'm not sure I actually know the answer to that. Uh, we, I, and certainly um, we know that, uh, I mean, the main player in the mouse is FGF4. I think FGF4 is expressed in the hu human embryo. What I didn't say, I don't think I said, is that the segregation of the, inner, of the epiblast and the primitive endoderm in the human is not dependent on FGF. So I told you that, that the first lineage decision appears to be hippo-dependent, and that's conserved. The, the epiblast primitive endoderm lineage uh, decision, there's a few, couple of different labs, and these are hard because you don't get a lot of embryos. There's a couple of different labs that suggest that if you inhibit FGF signaling in the human embryo, you don't block uh, primitive endoderm formation. So there probably are differences in, in FGF signaling um, but I, I yeah, don't don't press me on that one. Um, <laughs> but I think FGF four is there, but it's clearly not the major player. Great, thanks. Uh, now another question about FGF signaling. Uh, about uh, so it's from uh, Guilherme by Boaza. First he said it's fantastic. You know your talk was fantastic. It was really indeed. Uh, is it possible that F, uh, that the results of FGF signaling uh, were indirect effect on the ICM? And how can you distinguish? Well, so um, there are genetic experiments that support that support this. Um, so, and uh, so if you knock out FGF4, it's equivalent to blocking FGF4. You block primitive endoderm formation. You also block uh, proliferation of the trophectoderm. So I think all of those uh, are consistent with it acting in the cells themselves. Um, if an indirect effect, so it would have to be on the trophectoderm that then indirectly affects the inner cell mass. If you isolate the inner cell mass, which you can do, you can treat it with inhibitors and you get the same effect. So I'm pretty sure it's in the inner cell mass. FGF4 is expressed in the epiblast of the inner cell mass, 
the receptors are expressed more broadly, but FGF4 is actually restricted at the early stages to the inner cell mass. So pretty sure it's direct. Uh, now we have a question from Irene. Uh, so she's asking if the yak phosphorylation mutant uh, still has the morphological segregation between MCI and the trophoblast. Uh, is there a separate or parallel pathway for the morphological yeah, yeah, changes? Yeah. I think it's an important question, and I always I try to always point that out because people kind of ignore the fact that you get a blastocyst. Uh, what you don't get is establishing the right lineage uh, commitment in, in that blastocyst. We have a similar effect if we knock out CDS2. CDS2 is, the, is absolutely required to specify trophectodon fate. It, but you make something that looks like a blastocyst, it's just that all the outside, the other way around now, all the outside cells expressed in the cell mass markers. Uh, and then it you know, gets into trouble after that, but it starts by making what looks like a blastocyst. And I would argue, yes, that there is a separate pathway that is involved in polarity and establishing the sort of morphogenesis. Essentially, you make an epithelial layer, a polarized epithelium, and then secondarily, you make that into a trophectoderm epithelium. So the process of polarity, although they're closely linked, because there's also a lot of experiments where you interfere with polarity and you interfere with trophectoderm formation, but you, they're not absolutely tied together. And polarity, I would say, is running a separately and secondarily the, the cell fate is set on top of that. Not everybody would agree with that. But it, it's quite striking that you can make these mutations that morphologically begin to make something that you would swear is a normal blastocyst. Okay. So thank you very much. I think we have no further questions, but uh, there's lots of uh, compliments and uh, everybody really enjoyed your talk. It was really great. And again, we thank you very much. I don't know if you want to tell us uh, uh, something about the ISSCR or? Um... Well, I guess I would just uh, encourage everyone uh, in Brazil to consider joining the ISSCR if you haven't already. Um, I've been with the ISSCR actually from the, the very beginning and I was president a few years ago. I'm a developmental biologist, um, but you know, stem cell biology is developmental biology. So this is that this the ISSCR has a pretty broad remit. But what's really special about the ISSCR, I think, is that it, the first word international. Um, and there aren't many societies like that where we can really all join together around the world and really deal with some of the basic biology of stem cells, uh, the developmental biology of stem cells and the applications of stem cells, whether it's in regenerative medicine, modeling human development, uh, neurobiology, uh, you know, really this, the stem cell field is getting larger and more, more spread out. But what happens at the ISSCR meetings, whether they're the big annual meeting or the more local ones that take place, is a really great opportunity to join a vibrant uh, society and one that uh, is is recognized, is, uh, involves a field that is growing all the time. The other very important thing about the ISSCR and the international part is that it's very much involved in the uh, uh, ethical, legal, and policy issues around stem cell research, gene editing, and everything that's related to it. Uh, and that is where we really want more people to get engaged as well. And again, we want to be, we, the ISSCR wants to be engaged at an international level, making sure that when we can, when we hear about issues that are going on with uh, stem cell research, with legislation that may interfere, when there are issues with uh, stem cell clinics that are not undertaking you know, safe use of stem cells, these are all issues that the membership of ISSCR is very much concerned about and want to really contribute and uh, partner internationally to have an impact. We're in the middle of revising the international uh, guidelines for stem cell research, which ISSCR puts out. And as you may know, those guidelines that talk about stem cell research and human embryo research 
have become very widely uh, not necessarily accepted because obviously lo local legislation can override some of them, but as general guidelines that of how one should carry out research, they have got a lot of um, uh, in, um, activity and a lot of recognition worldwide. So ISSCR is there for the membership. And I think the leadership of the ISSCR really wants to do what the members want. It's like everybody else has gone virtual, just had its international meeting virtually. But yeah. building, on, building on that, they're doing more of these kind of virtual events. I think like many of us, you know, going virtual actually allows more international interactions. You don't necessarily have to travel. You can meet people uh, in the virtual world. So I hope that there are going to be more of these kind of interactions in the future. Yeah, we have several uh, Brazilians that are members. I'm a member and we had here Ligia Pereira was uh, also watching, yeah. uh, is still watching us and she's a member of the, the board. And yeah. uh, so it, all, all the meetings that I went were really great. I was registered for uh, this year's <laughs> meeting yeah. in a virtual form. So it was yeah. really great. Uh, so I want to remember uh, people that are watching that we're going to have the next one, uh, you know, our, our next webinar going to be in October 29. We're going to have Fiona Dutch. She's going to talk about uh, neuro stem cells. And also, uh, I, I'd like to remember that uh, we have our meeting, the, the SBBC meeting. It's going to be uh, in a hybrid form. We're going to have some people present and some people uh, virtually and it's going to be in January uh, in the submissions of uh, abstracts and in October 31st. So people that wanna you know, come to the, the virtual uh, or hybrid meeting are very welcome. So I think we can uh, end this. And uh, once again, it was a great pleasure and uh, honor for us to have you here. And thank you so much for accepting this invitation. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure to be here. Okay. Bye.